Good afternoon and welcome to the 176th episode of the Georgia Farm Bureau, Georgia Prep Sports Drive for the GHSA state title. It is Friday, November 18th, and we are going to have a great show. We are going to start with Najee Wilkins. We're going to break down the Buford-Walton matchup, pick any other potential second round upsets and some big matchups. We'll have Jordan on after that to make his um, typical Friday picks and then Number one ranked Cedar Town is going to join us in the final slot. That's Jamie Abrams. Uh, they've been so dominant this season. They're about to host Stevenson. And so we'll see what the Bulldogs' chances are this year to win that state title. But we're going to go ahead and get started with Najee. All right, so big matchup tonight. Uh, number one ranked Buford's going to host Walton. We know all the storylines, but I think it was interesting – uh, specifically your conversation with both coaches. So go ahead and just uh, talk about kind of what you saw when you were just talking to kind of both camps. Yeah, they're basically <clears throat> kind of the same things. They wanted to make sure they properly align their fits, uh, making sure they kind of, you know, very ca uh, gap sound, technique sound. Uh, big thing that stuck out with Buford was they want to go 1-0 and and everything. But it's not just 1-0 and winning the game, but 1-0 and in a rep, 1-0. Um, in the weight room, want to know, you know, in class, things like that, that really stood out to me um, for Buford and kind of like their standard and what they want to do in this game. And obviously depending on some of their playmakers. And then defensively, you know, Edric Houston, Justin Baker, some of those names that really stood out that he talked about. Um, Justin Baker's just a sophomore, but he plays linebacker and running back. So look for them to kind of lean on, on him and kind of to come in and fill in. And they got some good depth at the um, linebacker position. So I think that'll be huge in this game. And then for Walton, I mean, I, I just like the way he was talking. I like the way that Bruno came in this game. I mean, if you're going to come in here and you're going to do something special, you're going to do something that nobody's um, predicting you to do, you got to have that mentality. And he had it since Sunday. I mean, I mean, really, he's had it all season. But he, but he told his staff Sunday, like, look, if, if, if you're not coming in here and you don't believe we can win, then you can go ahead and get your butt out of here. Like, we're, that's not what we're here to do. You know, he had the same message to his players. So I think they got the right attitude coming in. Um, obviously, you know, he gave his um, due diligence and respect to, to Buford, but they're not scared to play them. And like I said, I liked how he came in, and I liked their playmakers, and that's why I got Walton with an upset. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, but, I mean, yeah. you've seen both teams play this season. Uh, Buford, obviously, is number one. I think uh, when I first saw the matchup, no one kind of wanted to be in that same uh, path as Buford in the playoffs just because they have been so – incredible in the playoffs year after year uh, but looking at this draw though it's like you started bringing up some points I started looking into it and it's a really tough matchup for them with this Walton team um, yeah they have Justice Haynes they have a great defense but I think you're absolutely right with uh, just the type of offense uh, Walton brings to the table I don't think Buford has faced that type of balance and that type of uh, just ability to distribute the ball to all these guys. Yeah, I, I don't think they have. I mean, you can make the argument, oh, well, hey, they played Mill Creek earlier, but I feel like they're more run-centric than anything. Obviously, Hayden Clark can throw the football really good, and, you know, they got playmakers in Mikhail Wood and, and Brennan Jenkins. But I just think, you know, they kind of depend more on their run, kind of set the pass. I feel like Walton, if they had to go and throw the ball 60 times, they could do it. And they got the players um, – you know, on the outside in order to be dangerous. They got, like, four different players that can, you know, make plays. Aiden Jackson, Hunter Till, Wyatt Sonderman, Cameron Lloyd. They got so many uh, weapons they can use. Makari Bottoms had over a 265-yard rushing game this year. So they just, like, their playmakers are, are, are lethal. They're dangerous. And if you go back and look at their week one matchup, Halinski threw for 426 yards and four TDs in that game. It wasn't because their offense couldn't go. Their offense put up 41 points. It is the defense couldn't get the stop. So that's the only thing that worries me in this game. Can – Consistently, can their defense get stops? But I think they have the offense. This is probably one of the best offenses they faced all year. That's just my opinion with Buford. Obviously, they faced other teams from Alabama, and I think it was another team um, in North Carolina they faced. But I think it's the best offense they faced all year. I completely agree. And so let's talk about this offense a little bit. Um, you mentioned Mill Creek. They had a <clears throat> pretty competitive game at Buford. They ended up falling short. Uh, Mill Creek is kind of a more run-oriented offense. I think you're right with Walton, though. If you look at what they did against uh, Kennesaw Mountain, what they did against Osborne, what they did against Wheeler before this recent playoff win, <laughs> Makari Botterford was kind of resting. He was only getting eight or ten carries. This last week against South Forsyth, I think he got 28. So they have a potential to run the ball. 
And then also, as as you said, I mean, Hecklinski can air it out. So really, they have that flexibility depending on what Buford does, depending on how fast they come out, to really play to either strength that they have. And I think uh, Makari Botterford, I mean, his ability to take 20 carries against these tough defenses, I think he has what it takes to have another big game against Buford, uh, kind of going up against another outstanding back. But I think he's been a huge MVP factor for them this year. Yeah, he has. He has. He's been the, the difference maker on that offense. He's he's kept it balanced. The defense wants to play a certain way. They want to you know play coverage. They want to um, not load the box. He can he can make you pay. If they want to load the box, at least he can make you pay throwing the football. So I just think, man, this is going to be a resume defining game in my opinion for them. Um, obviously, this is not as, as I talked to Coach Gruner. This is not the standard for them. Um, they had three goals to come into the year. One was to win the region title. One was in the opener and the closer. You know, they weren't able to do the first two goals, but they have the other goals still set in their sights. So that's what they want to do. And like I said, with having those playmakers, you can't just focus on one player. And like I said, I'm going to give Buford his credit and his love. I mean, we know this is a, this is a nationally ranked team, so this is not going to be easy, you know. And, and, and coming into this game, you know, obviously Buford will be favored. We know that. And they got all the five-star talent in the world. But sometimes, man, when playoffs come, upsets happen. And, and I just got a funny feeling in my gut that that's what it's going to be. Again, I could be wrong. I could look like an idiot on Monday, but I'm going to roll with it, and I just believe in Heliski at the quarterback position. That's my big thing. I feel like, and I was telling you yesterday, Craig, I feel like Buford is kind of that – when Nick Saban first got there at Bama, before they got, like, the, those, those quarterbacks that were kind of elite and really good, they were a run-dominant team. Like, you knew Alabama for running the football. Um, Mark Ingram, Derrick Henry. Um, Eddie Lacy. Eddie Lacy, you know, TJ Yo, like they got, they, they were known for their running backs, you know? So you go in and, and look how they were. They would play phenomenal defense, you know? And now they've kind of, you know, manifested and kind of matured to what they are today, right? So I feel like that's what kind of, that's, that's literally what Buford is. Dominant run football team, and they play really good defense. So well, if you're going to beat a, a good team like that, you have to, to me, you have to have the quarterback in order to do so. You know, no matter if you run the ball well, no matter if you have the playmakers, if you don't have a quarterback that can distribute the ball, make those pinpoint throws, and is accurate, and can make those consistent throws, as Bruner kind of alluded to, don't need him to be a superstar Superman, but make those consistent throws, I think Kalinske is the man for the job, and I think he's going to prove some people wrong. Yeah, um, I like the way Heklinski throws. I mean, he's good on the run, he buys himself time, and then when you watch him, he has kind of a unique air on the ball where he's really able to drop it in over the safety uh throw 30 yards downfield the intermediate routes he's got a big arm as well so i think uh in terms of a quarterback buford has not faced a electric guy like hecklinski and then you look at the way the the walton offense runs i mean sounds like i'm being a homer here but they to me they're the kansas city chiefs of uh high school football i mean the second that ball snapped, they have so much misdirection. They never really have just one guy they're going to. They have Cameron Lloyd, uh, Wyatt Sonderman. He has been a big uh, difference maker for them. Uh, but then Aiden Jackson is able to come in. So you never know who you're going to need to stop. I think Bruner pointed that out. He was really confident about that strength that they have offensively. And then, as we said, Makari Botterford is able to take these handoffs. So, I mean, Buford is not going to be able to hone in on one guy. I think Walton is going to be able to challenge that uh, excellent Buford defense. Yeah, I think they'll be able to challenge it in, in some ways. And, and the key in this game is going to be their offensive line. Obviously, we know the playmakers. We know Helensky. We know Botterford. But can their offensive line buy enough time? You know, can they not allow um, Houston – um, game breaker and a game breaker because you can have all the talent all day, but if he's back there wrecking the quarterback and getting in there and stopping run fronts and run fits and he's causing havoc, it could be a long night. So the big thing is going to be can they line protect enough for them to open up holes for those running backs and then being able to allow give time for Helensky to be able to throw. That's going to be a key part of this game too. I didn't really outline that in my preview, but I mean, thinking about it, that's going to be pretty huge too because their defensive line and their defensive front is stout. So again, with my, with my pick, it's no disrespect to Buford. It's not that we know that they're standard. We know they're a three-time state champion. Uh, they won three straight years in a row. It's not to disrespect Buford. It's just we. I like upsets. I like competitive football, and that's what I'm kind of hoping for. And it's some competitive football, and I think I just put the edge just a little bit, you know, or, or in general to, to Walton. Yeah. I mean, when I was first thinking of how Walton could pull off a win, it was, 
kind of like they're going to need the ball at the end, have like a, a last minute drive. But just thinking about, it, I really do think they can uh, be in control throughout the game and really put pressure on Buford. I think Buford has the edge in the kicking game. Uh, they obviously have KJ Bolden and Justice Haynes are able to return. Uh, they've been doing that all year. Justice Haynes had the big kickoff return against Mill Creek uh, to kind of steal momentum in that one. But what do you think about Walton's defense? Just uh, how Huge. they're going to have to try to funnel uh, Justice Haynes, kind of group tackle, but then also uh, what uh, Coach Bruner said, force them into these third and longs. I mean, that is going to be so key for them. Yeah, as he alluded to, winning on first and second down, putting them in, in, in third down and longs, making it harder for them instead of manageable third downs. That's going to start with um, being able to stop the run. You know, as he said, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll line up all the fits, you know, fill the holes, fill the lanes, and then before you know it, he's reversing field. That's how dynamic Justice Hayes is, you know what I'm saying? He's a five-star for a reason. We all know that. So Explain that a little bit, though, because what Coach Bruner was saying about feeling the hits and then what Justice Haynes is able to do in terms of using his vision to reverse it. I mean, that's such a key. Yeah, exactly. So let's say, right, for the audience, let's say um, all the gaps are protected, right? Let's say you got one, two, three gaps. So let's say all your linebackers and all your linemen kind of fill those holes. Hayes has the ability to go and see that, right? and say, okay, I'm going to reverse field. I'm going to be here. There's nothing here. You see this in the NFL and college a lot. He can go and reverse field, just make one swift cut, cut to the other side, and he's one-on-one -on -one with a safety. That safety don't make that tackle. He's going for a touchdown. So things like that are going to be huge in this game. Can the safeties make one-on-one -on -one tackles if that situation comes up? Because he's so dynamic. If a hole's if he's not run see, oh, I, wow, I have a big gap right here. I'm going to hit that hole right there. I'm going to hit that opening, and I'm going to make a move on this defender, and then it's just after that, it's lights out. I'm going to the end zone. So the key will be obviously filling those holes, making those one-on-one -on -one group tackles, and then if you see your safety there, if there's another linebacker on the other side, like, okay, that's already filled, getting all the way back over to make a game tackle and not allow him to, you know, go up and make a big play. Yeah, I think the defense will need to set the tone early. Um if you look at the games where Walton has struggled defensively, I mean, Mill Creek, they put up a ton of points on them. Uh, North Cobb, that was just a, a sloppy game all around. And then, obviously, North Paulding was able to pass all over them. But I don't think uh, Buford's offense is built like that. They have the big offensive line. They're going to want to go through Justice Haynes, uh, give him his carries. And then they do have some playmakers in the passing game, but – it's going to be so key for Walton to tackle well. I think they have a guy in Ashton Woods that can draw double teams. He can disrupt. He has tons of tackles for loss. He's physically, I mean, he's been playing since his freshman year in Class 7A, so I think he can handle that role. And then I've been impressed just even in those games where they haven't um, kind of prevented the other team off the scoreboard. They do have a physical defense, I think. I mean, they fly in there. Um, who else is it? Uh, it's not just um... – Josh, there was it Matthew Trainer. He said yep. – um, Matthew Trainer. yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Hardest hitting guys um, he's ever seen or coached in his career. So they got to bring their hard hats um, tonight for sure. And if they're hitting hard and, and they're making it difficult, you know, you got to like their chances. So just following, like I said, following those holes. And I'd say be aggressive defensively. Like if you can, bring some different pressures, bring some exotic blitzes at times. You know, when it – obviously when it, when it happens, you know, and offensively be aggressive on fourth downs, you know. But create some pressure because they're going to have to throw at some points in this game. Create some pressure on Wiki, make him uncomfortable, and let's see what he can do. Yeah, and then I think we're also going to see just in terms of the big stars in this game with uh, K.J. Bolden, we'll see guys play um, two ways. And then I also yep. think uh, we might even see some creativity in the Buford play calling, like putting Justice Haynes uh, in a wildcat we might even see him throw the ball. I mean, I think uh, we're really going to see a creative game plan uh, from both teams. Yeah, you're going to see him pull out all the stops, you know, and that's what you want to see. This high-profile type of, a, you know, game, I think, you know, you want to see all the creativity. You want to see the trick plays. You want to see Haynes line up in the backfield. You might want to see Botterford line up in the backfield or a fleet flicker play uh, for Jeremy Haliski. You want to see all the stops, you know, and that's what makes Georgia football so great. And I think – what will happen in this game is you'll be like, okay, well, Georgia football is really different. And I think a lot of people in the country know that. But if you see something like this actually happen, and you're like, wow. Like, they move up to 7A and they had a team go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. That would just be different just from a national standpoint because Buford's nationally ranked, you know. So I'm hoping for a good game. 
Yeah, and then, I mean, this offseason, I think it was interesting with Heklinski. Um, his first two years, he was splitting time with Zach Rosman, who was another great Walton quarterback, kind of ran that system. Similarly, uh, they had kind of the same amount of throws each game. But this offseason, Coach Bruner really put the pressure on Heklinski to step up in that leadership role. Uh, he, he is a junior, but he's also a guy. I mean, he is older for his for his grade he got held back in the eighth grade so he he is kind of the oldest guy on the team right now he is that leader do you expect Walton to go out there though kind of with a swagger to them like show up and arrive and like kind of portray that confidence level like I think that's going to be something we might see they're going to come out there with that confidence and swagger for sure um I I'm, I'm sure you know this credit as long as you've been covering sports um, the team embodies their coach. If you're if whatever your coach is coming off with, that's what you're going to embody. I don't think they're not confident at all coming to this game. They are confident. They feel like they can come in here and get a win. And they feel like they can come in here and pull off a major upset. And I think they're going to come in with that swagger. But like I said, if, if if it's them, they want to get the ball first, hit them in the mouth. Like that's it. Straight up, just like that. You want to go in there and kind of put get them on their heels. You can get them on their heels early. You know, I you 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 feel really good. So come in there early. Or if, if they're on defense, getting the stop early in the game and going down and scoring. Things like that, you know, makes a difference early in the game. Obviously, it's a four quarters, but you want to have a hot and a good start to this game. Yep, I expect um, I expect Walton to want to receive the ball. be interesting if Buford makes that same decision. Um, I wouldn't want to give Walton their off uh, – sorry, Walton's offense the ball to start off. We'll see, though. But just looking at the numbers, so Walton's offense, 292 passing yards per game. 173 rushing yards per game so that that's more passing yards but still nearly 200 rushing yards you look at Buford it's kind of the opposite 235 rushing yards per game and then just 102 passing yards per game so I really think that's the contrast of styles right there but I would not be surprised if Walton goes to the ground game to try to control the ball knowing that yes their offense has the firepower to explode, but also keeping the ball out of Justice Haynes' hands is going to be a key in this game. Yeah, for sure. Because um, you think about it, on the other side of the ball, they like to run the football. Not saying they couldn't throw it. They could throw it if they wanted to, but they're going to lean on the ground attack. They're going to lean on Justice Haynes and Justin Baker running the football. So if, let's say they go down, you know, 7-0, 14-0, they're going to just run the football down the field and milk the clock. So they're going to play ball control. So – that's why I said going down early wouldn't be, you know, beneficial for Walton. Like, you want to get, get that early start. So, and like you said, if you can go and you can control the game yourself and, you know, make them into a you, – you, you just said it, Craig. I just thought about it. Make them into a passing team. So, when you're down in the game and it's whatever, 14 or, or it's 21 – like, you, you, you could run the football, but you're more prone to want to pass the football. So, it's more difficult in that situation because the time's kind of against you and you're kind of thrown off your element. So that's why I said a hot start is important. And like you said, you got that hot start and you ball controlling it with Father for running the football as well. It's almost like in a way, oh, wow, we found ourselves down 14. You know, are we going to stay in our kind of our game plan or are we going to have to switch it up? So that's kind of the big thing there too. Yeah, and I'm going to be really interested to see kind of how both of these teams try to close out the first half, like how aggressive they're going to be. I think Walton has proven they have the ability to – two-minute offense, four-minute offense. Um, they do a really good job at using the clock uh, kind of in any scenario. They have the tempo also. I think with, with Buford, I mean, they're kind of like a grinded-out team. Um, you look at their game against Petrie Ridge, they score touchdowns on their first four drives, all long drives. But, I mean, what about Buford's passing game? I mean, can they find it against a – Walton this this week and kind of open up that play action and open up the ability to to run by putting pressure on that Walton secondary or do you think they'll just try to rely on that run yeah I think you'll see a little bit of a mixture here I think you'll see them obviously lean on the run but like try to sell play action and like I said I I, I think they have the athletes um you know it's not that beautiful they have plenty you know um KJ Bolden King Joseph Edwards they got some players that can can burn you um in the receiving game. I'm just, I just want to see, because as Coach Apple alluded to, Dylan Wiki has been up lately. He's been playing great, which is good, but he's been up and down this season. So is he going to be up? 
uh, Friday night is going to be down. So I think that's an interesting thing to see too, you know, as far as their offense. But I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure if they lean on the, the ground attack and it's working well, they can set up some play um, action and some passes. Yep, and as I said, special team is going to be huge. Um, I would not punt it to Justice Haynes, that's for sure. I'd punt that thing out of bounds. You do not want to give up that big play. But just in terms of 7A, I mean, if Walton is able to pull this win off, um, I think it would represent kind of a, a renaissance at the Class 7A level because it's not about just having these bigger teams. I mean, you go back like 15 years ago – when Camden and all those teams were dominating, they're just winning state titles by running the triple option. You can't really do that anymore. And I think we're just going to see the level of preparation uh, from a team like Walton, from a team like Buford with its defensive game plan that's really going to show people like just the level of play in uh, Class 7 A Georgia. I mean, it is next level right now. I don't think it's ever been better. So I think that's what we're going to see. But what would a Walton win kind of significant – or signify just in the bigger picture of 7A and what the future looks like? It would be huge. It just shows you, okay, hey, this is not a dominant run 7A. Anybody has a chance. If you got the preparation, you got the coaching, you don't necessarily need – now, I'm not saying that they don't have D1 athletes on their roster. Walton doesn't. They definitely do. But you necessarily need a D1 or a five-star to go in here and win a game. You know, obviously, you got playmakers and things like that, but if you're well coached, you believe, you put the, the preparation and you put the work in and the effort, it shows that you can compete against anybody. And I think that's what I love about 7-8. I mean, it's always been up, up for grabs. Last year was different. I mean, Collins Hill, they had so many great athletes all over their team. You know, they had, you know, the number one dude, guy in the country in Travis Hunter. And they had Sam Horn, uh, you know, an elite quarterback. You know, so they had so much talent on that team. You know, that one, that year was probably, you know, different. You know, but, I mean, like I said, they pulled this win. One, it's going to open up more offers for all those players, Aiden Jackson, the Hunter Tills, the Jeremy Helinskis, the Makari Botterfords, the White Sondermans. And it's going to show that, hey, if you come in, you believe, and you buy into what we're teaching at this program, and you do what you need to do, this is, this is what can happen. So I think it would just be sending a message throughout 7-8. Yep, and as you guys can tell, we're really excited about this one. It will be the first ever meeting between Walton and Buford. Uh, so much on the line, so... Yeah, it is. So it's going to be incredible. And I'm looking at the Maxwell projections. Um, just a, a side note, there weren't really that many upsets in the first round. I think out of the 127 games that were played, Lincoln County got the bye. There were only 16 games that uh, went to the underdog in the Maxwell ra uh, rankings or not ratings, uh, projections in the first round. Um, so I'm looking at it right here. The computer models, they have Buford as a 16-point favorite winning a 28-12. to 12. Uh, They give them an 87% chance of winning. 95% uh, of the people picked Buford in the Cobb County Married a Daily Journal poll. But I want to talk about some other potential upsets yes. in uh, Class 7A. Uh, specifically, we'll get into the other ones too, but... Who else do you think can pull off a, a big win um, just in this second round that people might not be uh, paying attention to in 7A? Um, let's see. Let's see. I don't know if that's an upset, but I, I think even though it's my alma mater, Norcross, I think Milton um, is going to pull that one out. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Norcross beats Mill Creek. Um, I like Mill Creek. Um, they got a really talented team, but North Cobb is doing something special over there. And they haven't had Malachi Singleton for most of the season since that Buford game. And Grimstead has been playing exceptionally well. They went down 3-0 in that game against Denmark, and they put up 42 points unanswered. Um, so they, I like what they're doing over there. I, I wouldn't be shocked if they um, won that game. Um, I think the other one was North Gwinnett Lambert. Um, that was a tough one to call. Um, if I had to put my money, oof. I'm going to go with North Gwinnett on that one, um, beating Lambert. Um, yeah, Lambert's I think favored that's by seven, game. so that would be an upset. Yeah, but I think that's going to be a good game. Uh, look out for that one, but I'm going to put my money on North Gwinnett. Um, what's some other match? Uh, so Parkview, Westlake's got, favored I, over Parkview. What do you yeah, think about that one? I got Parkview with an upset. Yeah. yeah. I think they're going to run the rock. Uh, Westlake is known for running the football, too. Uh, they jumped out to a 34-14 lead against North Pauline last week. Running the ball with Kyrie Spain, throwing the ball with Hulk. 
um, hitting some of their weapons. But I think Godfrey got them playing at the right time. So um, I'm going to go with the upset there. Yeah, I agree. And another one that I would not be surprised at, uh, it's going to be tough, but I think Camden County is going to give grace in a game. I mean, Ooh. that North Georgia, South Georgia rivalry is real. I mean, I was at a seven on seven a couple years ago. I don't want to call out uh, Grayson too much, but I think they called um, one of the South Georgia schools swamp people, uh, for, and they were not happy. They were about to uh, throw hands in the middle of the seven on seven. But I, I just was impressed what Camden County did against East Coweta last week. They had a just game changing third quarter. They didn't allow East Coweta to get a single first down, and then their offense kind of just poured it on them. So I think if Camden uh, finds a spark, uh, they might be able to uh, get past Grayson. But obviously, uh, that defense is playing lights out for Grayson. Is real. Yeah. yeah. So. Only reason I can't go with Camden County, I just believe too much in what Adam Carter is doing over there. I know some people are not sold on them because they, they, they have two losses. But, I mean, last game against Hillgrove, they had like three different touchdowns, I think, that didn't even come from their offense. You know, so you can get that consistently and your offense isn't <clears throat> almost say necessarily not playing well, but it didn't score a lot of points. That bodes well in your favor. And they got talent all over that roster. So yeah. I, I, I would just roll with Gracie in that one. If it's a different kind of opponent, I would go with you. But I do, I do think Camden County will compete in that game. They played exceptionally well against um, East Coweta, um, but I, my money's on Grayson. <clears throat> yep, and it's interesting if you think back to the season. It's like Grayson loses to Lowndes. Lowndes lose to East Coweta, and then now they're playing another South Georgia team. So that would be an interesting one. Um, but yep. then uh, let's go to the other game that you really honed in on. Uh, I think it's going to be an outstanding matchup. Cambridge against Cartersville. And the first thing I want to say, uh, listening to Coach Bennett, he was talking about how they have really gone from a team that passed the ball a ton in the past. I think their quarterback that graduated last year had 8,000 career passing yards and then this year, I mean, that run game has been uh, really successful for them. So just what do you think about Cambridge, uh, just what they've been able to do this season and uh, what that matchup against Cardsville looks like? It's the O-line, man. I, I talked to Coach Bennett this week. It's that offensive line. They beg him to run the football. Um, we found it out against Kale. I talked to him about that drive they had against um, Kale in that game. They were up 30, 35, 24 at the scoop and score. Went down, milked the clock, won the game. They got, you know, playmakers too. Even though they like to run the ball, uh, I think four different players scored in that, in that game against Kelly. They had another game like that against uh, Great Atlanta Christian this year. So these teams are evenly matched. Um, they both like to do similar things. They both like to impose their will. They're very physical at the point of attacking at the line of scrimmage. Uh, they both – offensive lines are great. Um, they both lean on them very heavy to kind of ru run the football and set up the pass. Um, for Cartersville, they got Malachi Jeffries, who has 1,098 yards rushing, I think 15 touchdowns, have an exceptional season. But they can throw the football too with Paul Gamble. And Jamari Bryce, their sophomore, is having a great season. So, I mean, I think that'll be interesting to see how will, you know, Cambridge defensive line kind of hold up against and up, uh, for, for Cambridge, you know, just leaning on Isabor. And they just have a bunch of players that just buys into the team, you know. Um, will Taylor had a, a thousand, near a thousand yard season last year. You don't see him complaining at all. You know, he, he blocks, you know, in that game we see him, he had two touchdowns against Kale, but. You know, they all buy into the element of rushing the football, leaning on Isabor and the running backs, Jock Marlowe, and, and things like that. And that's made the difference this year. And I, I actually wanted to shout out Coach Bennett. I mean, to be where that program was when he started, I mean, they had a couple of, you know, good winning seasons. But to be, you know, on the hot seat and to just ride out that storm and be where that program is now, first region title in, in, in school history. Now they got a chance to have the best finish in school history. I mean, that's just exceptional. And, and think about it, Craig. They don't have any five-star, four-star, three-star, two-star, one-star players. Like, none of them, I don't think, have power five offers. So, I mean, when you think about it, what he's doing with that program is exceptional. And they've always been there in the second round. We'll see if they're able to get over it, um, get over the edge this year. But, I mean, exceptional is what he's doing there. And I think this is a primetime matchup. I mean, 9-2 and two versus 10-1. and one, um, It's going to be a good one. Yeah, Cambridge has – it's also just found itself in like tough regions in the past. I think there were some seasons they were six and four missing out on the playoffs. So yeah, he was under a lot of pressure and they have definitely risen to the occasion. And you're exactly right. It, they really do play like a team. Uh, Cartersville is a three point favorite in that one. They're projecting a 27, 24 win. Uh, but I think uh, Cambridge might continue that incredible season they're having. Um, another 
upset that I want to ask you if you think uh, this one might happen is Gainesville against South Paulding. Uh, Gainesville's undefeated. They have them as a nine-point favorite. Um, I think the game you were at, though, I mean, Darius Cannon really saved them that game. Um, obviously, Baxter right at quarterback was great, too, but uh, his big plays, he lifted them over North Versailles. So, I mean, how vulnerable is Gainesville? They're going to be at home again, but playing a South Paulding team that um, – has played some really good games. I mean, if if they come out and put it all together, that's going to be a tough matchup for for Gainesville for yeah. sure. Yeah, they're sleeping on South Paulding. I, I first want to give credit and love to Stacey Hopkins too, who had that defensive pass breakup, created pressure all night in that game against North Side that had um, that allowed them to win that region title. He was huge in that game. Um, Darius Cannon just went off. Um, I I seen it in the first half. He was just having his way against their corners. Um, and I, I think, you know, he's going to have a big game in this one. Niam Cheeks is also a really good running back for them. He's very elusive. He can make one or two, uh, three different defenders miss. So the key for Gainesville, penalties, turnovers. You do that against the South Paulding team, like I, I'll be seeing them in, in 10 penalties, two turnovers, you're not going to win the game. And Jamario Wilcox is, is the real deal. And that needs to be said. He's the real deal. So um, if they come in here and they play like that, Gainesville is not going to win this game. Um, but South Paulding, I like what they're doing. They, they compete. They play tough. They play well. Um, and they got – I like what they're cooking up over there. And they got a, a pretty decent quarterback. And I like their weapons on the outside too. So, I wouldn't be surprised if South Paulding won. I, I'll go with an upset in this one with South Paulding winning. Um, I don't know what the score is going to be. I can never predict the score. But I'm going to say South Paulding can go in there and get an upset. Yeah, that will be an outstanding matchup. Um, South Paulding was in that – Incredible region last year with, uh, I think it was Johns Creek, who was really good last year, Rome. And so they played all those teams in non-region. And then their region this year was completely new, but it was so difficult with Hughes, uh, Douglas County. And so I think, uh, yeah, they're definitely battle-tested. Uh, Gainesville has had some easy games. They played some quality opponents, but that will be a tough matchup. I think I'm also interested to see what Rome does against Alpharetta. I saw Reese Fountain uh, kind of went out in the first half last week, um, so I haven't heard about his status. Uh, he usually does play at least the third quarter, even if they're up big. Um, but, I mean, that would be big. If Reese Fountain's not healthy, I think Alpharetta is a dangerous opponent for sure. Um, and then what do you think about Roswell and Alatoona? That's one of the biggest margins in the projections. They have uh, Roswell as a 23-point favorite over Alatoona, but the way their defense has been playing, I mean, it's been a mystery to me how this Alatoona team has turned it on. I mean, they've also had close losses to Cartersville where they're in control of that one. I mean, do you think Alatoona uh, can kind of pull something off against Roswell? That defense. And lights. I mean, they've been depending kind of on their ground game. I mean, if they uh, kind of do that same format against Roswell, you know, they got to like their chances. Uh, Roswell does have a really good defense. Um, you know, I think at one point they were in their last two or three games, they're averaging like 5.5 points given up. So, and they got a lot of playmakers. Um, Christian Elko had two touchdowns in the game. We've seen them on TV for the region title. Um, Ethan Nation is dangerous in the return game and, and, and getting punts. Um, their quarterback, KJ Smith, is really good throwing the football. Their running back, Nakai Davenport, had three rushing touchdowns. So, I don't know, man. I mean, I was wrong last week in, in picking Douglas County to beat them because it, it was the same thing. I thought they had all those weapons. They wouldn't be able to stop them. But I, I, I got to tell you, I'm not going to sleep on Alatuna. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they start that game. But I don't know, man. That, that one I'm kind of torn on. I mean, not that Roswell is a good team, but I predicted one like this last weekend, and I was wrong. So I, I don't know. I'm kind of – I got to see it. I can't really make a prediction on now who's going to win. But don't sleep on Alatuna. That's all I can say. I agree. Well, I went over on the time, but thank you so much, Najee. We're going to have to cut it short, or not short, but we're going to bring Jordan on before uh, Coach Abrams. So uh, thank you so much, Najee. Go to scorytail.com. Go to Najee's social media. He has that great interview with Coach Bennett and all that content up there. Great stuff, Najee. Thank you. All right, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be back on the other side. Our mission has always been to support Georgia farmers. That's why we created Georgia Farm Bureau Mutual Insurance Company, providing financial protection that farmers needed. While this remains the same today, we've grown to protect all Georgians through home, auto, and life insurance. From the very beginning and into the future, 
We stand for every Georgia community. We are all from all right, welcome back. So we're going to bring on Jordan Dubroff next, and we're going to pick some of these games. Let me see if he texted uh, some he wanted to predict. Uh, and then we'll have Coach Abrams on after this. Let's see. Okay, so yeah, he wants to make a prediction on this Walton Buford game. Uh, once again, I don't normally come on here and make predictions, but uh, Najee didn't convince me he – kind of talked about what he heard from Coach Bruner and Coach uh, Appling. And then once I started looking into it, I became convinced. I'm like, all right, I think Walton's offense uh, presents some real problems for, for Buford just in terms of their ability to run or pass. I think um, Mill Creek was able to put points up on them, and I think Jeremy Hecklinski is a better quarterback than they've seen this year. So uh, – it's just going to be an outstanding matchup for sure. And if you watch Heklinski tonight, you're going to see a quarterback that can really um, show off his timing. And he has a quick deliver delivery. Uh, he throws on the run. I mean, he can absolutely sling it and throws a beautiful ball. And then his receivers are just all getting involved. So they are just such a fun team to watch. And we are going with the Raiders in this one. But let's see what Jordan's thinking. All right, Jordan, how's it going? I'm good. How are you guys? Doing well. So I don't know if you got to listen, but we really spent a lot of time breaking down this Walton matchup. I um, mean, what a historic opportunity playing the number one ranked team, Buford. It's hard to think that Walton could outplay off Buford, but um, there's also that sense that something could change in 7A where this uh, kind of new type of offense and uh, just a – group that's been playing well together can come in and shock the Wolves. What do you think about uh, tonight's matchup? Jordan, you there? Oh, all right. We'll, do, we'll just uh, text Jordan. We'll put uh, Jordan on after. Does that work? Okay, so yeah, we'll just bring Coach Abrams on now, and then uh, Jordan's going to join us after. And so, Cedartown, as you guys know, Class 4A, that's where Nick Chubb played. They did make a run to a state championship a few years back, and I think they got beat. I forgot who they played, um, but it was a pretty sizable margin. And I think a lot of the response was, oh, well, that's just a – these North Georgia football schools, they don't have what it takes to win a championship, and I think that is definitely changing. And if you look just what Cedartown's done this year, um, this past season, they lose to Calhoun 31-7. to This year, they go up there, they beat them 21-7. to So they're senior-led this year. They've kind of been building for this. This is the third year Coach Abrams has been there, and they are just absolutely dominating, and I'm excited to have them on, but – Look at this. They've scored 475 points this season and allowed just 152. They beat Cedar Shoals 49 nothing in the first round. And then most of these points they're giving up. I mean, they're coming in the second half. They're coming after they're already up 42 nothing and resting their starters. Uh, you have other situations where I think I wrote it down. Yeah, in one of the games, it's like they'll have seven rushing touchdowns, six different guys. I mean, they are an absolute offensive, well-oiled machine at this point, and it is that experience that they have. Reese Tanner at quarterback, a multi-year starter. Uh, you started seeing them add a little passing element into their, their offense in the past couple of seasons, but then this year he's really made some big plays. Uh, he'll throw maybe nine passes, eight passes a game, and two of them are going for touchdowns. So they've been hitting the big plays and also just uh, continuing that outstanding ground game. All right, Coach Abrams, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? Doing, doing well also. So uh, this has been quite the season. Uh, you guys have had um, so much excitement around the program. I was talking about how you have a group of seniors that – has kind of been through this process uh, the last couple of years, but just talk about the excitement around the program and just what this season has uh, meant. 
Well, I mean, you, you hit it on the head. We do have a, a large group of seniors and a large group of seniors who have played um, a lot of football. Um, and, you know, we kind of came up a little short last year and, and kind of left a bad taste in their mouth. So uh, they know what it's like to, to be in these playoff games and, and they know, you know, how heartbreaking it is to, to come up just a little bit short. Um, so, you know, they've, they've kind of used that as fuel to drive them this year. Yes, for sure. And so you guys were in the semis last year. I was looking at it. You guys had big wins over Perry, I think, in the quarters. And then it was a 22-21 uh, loss to Carver. Was that a two-point conversion at the end? I can't remember. Yeah, it was. A, uh, we had the ball fourth and one. Um, they stopped us, uh, kind of beat us at the point of attack there. And then um, we held them to fourth and one. They scored and then went for two and you know, we were up at 21 to 14 at that point. So, you know, that's, that's one of those things that, that sticks with you for a long time. Yeah, well, you guys have certainly come out um, blazing this year. Talk about this uh, non-region schedule though. I thought you guys definitely challenged yourself. Rock Mart, Callaway, Sequoia, Calhoun, and Dalton. Uh, before we get to the Calhoun win, I know that one was big, but what do you see in that Rockmart game just from your, your seniors coming out uh, playing a Rockmart team that's really been great this year, but Eli Barrow, 21 tackles in the season opener. I mean, that is really setting the tone uh, defensively for you guys. Yeah, um, you know, Eli's a very goal-oriented kid, and he had certain goals that he wanted to meet this year. And, um, you know, it, it started out, I saw a little bit out of our team that, it didn't start out very well. We kick off to them and they return for a touchdown and our kids didn't, didn't flinch. I mean, rolled right back down and scored and, um, you know, kind of took control of that ball game. So, uh, and, and I do think they're a very good football team. Uh, a lot of team speed, uh, much like Stevenson tonight. I mean, Stevenson, uh, is extremely fast. I feel like so, um, you know, I kind of learned learned a little bit about us there in 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 that game, um, and not not flinching. You know, um, you go into the next games, Callaway. You know what they've done uh, over the course of the last few years. If you know anything about Georgia high school football, we go to Calhoun or excuse me, uh, the Callaway game, and then, then we have uh, Sequoia, Calhoun, and, and Dalton. All of those teams are playoff teams. Um, I think I looked at our schedule the other day and. I want to say maybe seven or eight of the teams that we played were in the playoffs. So, um, you know, I think it's important to test yourselves and, and be battle tested when you come into these games like tonight. Yeah, and only one team didn't finish with a winning record. But I want to talk about the off season. I'm sorry to go back, but I mean, we've seen some of these viral videos coming out. Uh, Nick Chubb squatting, whatever it was, 700, 800 pounds, the Harlem Diamond. Uh, video recently. I mean, how much stronger did your team get this off season? Just th explain just the type of work you guys put in, just what uh, the strength and conditioning program uh, has meant to Cedartown, how that has really helped you guys uh, step up as a program. Uh, uh, Coach Mike Worthington, uh, he's been here for a long time and, and he's really the reason that Nick comes back and works out. You know, he trained Nick for the combine and, and, um, and Nick comes back here every every off season. Every time he's off, it's not only Nick, but we got several guys that are playing college football. And anytime they're in town and we're working out, you know they're there too. And I think that's uh, that's really big for our kids to see those guys and see where they are. They watch them on TV, and then they see uh, you know what they what they do in the off season. So I think that's big for our kids. And we had a lot of guys just show up. You know, this summer we had great attendance in the summertime. Uh, you know, over two thirds of our team missed two workouts or less uh, in the summer. So they've been together, just kind of, you know, show up every day with a with a lunch pail like attitude and, and work. And you got a lot of kids who have gotten a lot stronger. We got kids who have gotten stronger during the season, and um, I think that's important too. That's one of our goals is to be stronger in, you know, week eleven than we were week one. And so we got. You know, one of our offensive linemen, Dustin Green, he benched 405 last week and he benched 415 this week. So he's another one of those three-year starter kids that, you know, people probably don't know his name, but but he's here every day and busting his butt. Yeah, that's big time. Uh, 415 bench in high school. 
I think we might have had one guy come close to that uh, back in my day. That's crazy. And he was probably on steroids. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but what about uh, the Sequoia, sorry, the Sequoia game, uh, 35 nothing. I was looking at uh, the defensive effort in that game. You guys held them to like 40-something yards, like 50 yards. Uh, I mean, Sequoia is not a bad team. So, I mean, how good has your defense been playing this season? Uh, we talked about Eli, but just overall, just um, – the passing uh, defense, uh, getting after it, uh, being in the right assignments, and just playing as a group. Yeah, I mean that's that's important. And like I said, we we got a, just a bunch of kids who have played a lot of football, played together for a long time, at, at even coming up through, you know, rec and middle school. You know, we're not getting we're not getting a bunch of guys that transfer in here. We just got a, a bunch of hometown kids who who play for each other and 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 love each other and. Don't want to let each other down. So and that's a that's a big part of defense. Yeah, I mean playing that well, thirty-five nothing win over Sequoia before the big Calhoun game. I mentioned you guys uh, lost that one uh, the previous year, thirty-one to seven. Obviously Calhoun, uh, outstanding program. They've really been the gold standard, in kind of North Georgia. Uh, what did that mean? Just to see you guys come out there, get the twenty-one-seven win, just in terms of confidence and putting uh, your expectations into focus this season? Uh, that was, I mean, that was really big for us. You know, I thought last year uh, the Calhoun game kind of woke us up a little bit and, and kind of, you know, brought to light some things that we needed to, we needed to fix. I think this year, you know, they knew what they were getting into. And the two years prior, Calhoun had come down here and, um, you know, I kind of made it a point to them to tell them, like, look, you know, exactly what you said you know for the last 20 years if you want to talk about football in northwest georgia you got to talk about calhoun you know so if you want to be in that conversation you got to deal with people like calhoun and you know the great thing about calhoun i, I have nothing but respect for what coach lamb has done up there all those years and then coach stevenson now um i just think that um when you go up there it's going to be a a playoff like atmosphere pretty much every week you know the fans are right on top of you and you know it was a big big crowd and big game and things that that you're going to deal with in the playoffs so um, that was a huge huge win for us um, and you know our kids showed a lot of resolve in that game too you know and, and they got and they get to see you know you can point out you know Calhoun never went away in that game you know it was it was right until the last drive you're still dealing with them and, and, and having to having to make plays. It's not like they're giving you anything. You got to go make plays, and, and that's what I think we we brought or learned from that experience. Yeah, <clears throat> they are such an outstanding program. Uh, when I went to UGA, and we probably had three or four former Calhoun guys on the roster. They were the smartest guys on the team. They just were just outstanding football players. So yeah, they are producing really quality guys. They have a lot of two-way players, just a tough, um, outstanding flagship program. Uh, but then after that, you guys play Dalton. Uh, they've had a great year, 43-9, another big win. Um, what have you seen, though, from Reese Tanner, though? I'm just him kind of in his senior year, he's been able to get involved passing the ball, uh, just how he has been handling uh, just game after game. Well, I mean, Reese is almost a three-year starter, and he's he split some time as a sophomore. Um, but he's got a lot of game experience, and, and he he's really just has a great grasp of what we're trying to do. You know, um, kind of kind of like having a coach on the field. That's what you want at quarterback, and a guy that really understands everything. You know, he'll come in. Uh, even this week, he comes in. He was like, "I was looking at this." I mean, we share film with him already, and he's like, well, "I was looking at this. I think this will work. This will work." You know, so it's like having another coach, and it's really—he's um, a great kid, and and you know, he plays baseball. He's a multi-sport athlete. He's just um, just a phenomenal kid. We have a lot of kids like him, you know, that that are just really good kids. Come from good families, and and. Uh, it means something to him and he's he's a he's a big time competitor you know he's he's not very big but you know sometimes i think he thinks he weighs about 230 240 so uh but that you kind of like that too so you, you'd rather say whoa than sick him yeah i think you guys have that attitude all over the place uh with your roster 
And then I want to talk about the Central uh, Carroll game real quick. That was the region opener. They've been having a great season. I'm really interested to see what they do against Holy Innocence tonight. I think that will be a really intriguing matchup. But in that game, it looks like Eli Barrow had five sacks in that one. So they're obviously yeah. a team. They were trying to pass the ball. They've been outstanding all season. But, I mean, what is it about his ability to get to the quarterback? Well, um, those were more um, – he was just kind of – Sitting, sitting back, and and the kid would break contain, and and he would go get him. And, you know, we we had some uh, some trouble with him earlier. And they, Central does have an outstanding team. Uh, quarterback's a really uh, really good player, and um, he was making plays earlier. And Eli kind of got it fixed, and after he got rolling, he was kind of a one man wrecking crew. Yeah, and then against Heritage, um, I thought Reese Tanner played a really great game. I saw some. Uh, highlights from it. That was a top 10 matchup. You guys knew you needed to have that one uh, to continue your region path. And it looks like you guys just really dominated. I think that might have been the game I saw a highlight of Harlem Diamond just catching like a post route <laughs> and he was in the end zone. You guys had like a 42 point lead and it was just like you could just tell you guys were clicking on all cylinders. So, I mean, how big was that Heritage win? No, it was that was a big win too. You know they were undefeated. We were undefeated at the time, and um, it was a, a road game for us. So um, I think um, you know we we came out and and, and started fast in that when we scored on our first play from scrimmage. Uh, they got the ball first, and we stopped them, and then we scored on our first play from scrimmage. So um, that kind of got things going. Um, you know, Reese, I think. I can't remember what – I don't remember stats. I, don't, I really don't even keep up with them or pay much attention to them. But um, I know he's um, he's had some, some games where he's thrown, uh, you know, some some really good shots. And, you know, he's not throwing it a bunch, but he's throwing it um, throwing it for, um, for big plays. Yeah, he was 5 of 5, 109, and two touchdowns in that game. And then I wanted to ask you about Patrick Gardner, uh, Demarcus Gardner, uh, Camarion Davis, just the other guys that have just uh, stepped up and helped you guys um, just really uh, get everyone involved. Yeah, Patrick is um, – he's a, a three-year starter at fullback for us. Uh, also plays on the defensive line. Um, he's a load. He's hard for guys to deal with. He's, he's uh, you know, kind of like a, a, a runaway – runaway semi truck uh, when he's got the ball. So he's, he's a big kid and he clears out holes. And I think the one thing that for all those kids, like you mentioned, Kamarion um, and Harlem and Xavier uh, Hargrove, you know, th those guys, they block for one another as well. We're wing T. So, so they have to be unselfish and they got to realize, you know, sometimes it, it may not be my night to shine. Um, so they've done a really outstanding job with that this year too. You know, Kamarion's a, a smaller uh, water bug type back. Um, Xavier is just an unselfish blocker. Harlem is kind of a, a multi-purpose back, and and Patrick's just a you know a big bruiser. So um, you know all those guys have done that. And then outside, you know, Demarcus has come on here of late and, and caught a few uh, big balls for us in the last two games. And he's just a sophomore, but I think he's a extremely talented uh, talented young man too. That uh, his best football is ahead of him. Yeah, he also had an interception in this uh, playoff win, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He he plays on both sides of the ball as well. He's had he's had a couple touchdown passes. I think at Northwest uh, Whitfield the other night he had he had a catch for a touchdown, and then he had one against Cedar Shoals. And um, you know, uh, Tay Harris has had a couple of those too. He's another sophomore um, DB for us, and you know he had a big hit the other night in the uh, Cedar Shoals game and. He had a touchdown catch uh, and a touchdown run against Northwest Whitfield. So, um, you know, all those guys, have, they kind of understand their role and embrace their role and, and uh, you know, just do what they can to, to help us all be successful. Yep. And so, yeah, the Southeast Whitfield game, you guys were up 48 nothing at the half. Six different guys rushed for touchdowns. Closed out the perfect regular season uh, Northwest Whitfield win and then the big 49 nothing win over Cedar Shoals. Uh, two touchdown passes from uh, Tanner Reese, uh, just another outstanding performance. Uh, so, I mean, you mentioned Stevenson, though. Uh, you obviously saw their kind of last-minute comeback uh, against Pace Academy. I mean, as a coach, you, you see a team have a comeback like that. 
you got to tell your players, hey, watch this. They're going to keep competing. They have this ability. So, and what do you see just uh, with this Stevenson team and just what you saw last week, um, them kind of able to close out that game against uh, Pace Academy? Yeah, and that's exactly right. I told, told our kids, like, look, they're, they're not going away. You know, they showed a ton of resolve in that game. Um, I think the quarterback – or not quarterback, the running back was uh, statewide player of the week for the, you know, Georgia high school football daily. Uh, they're, they're extremely big on the offensive front, and they're extremely fast on defense. So um, I just think they're, you know, obviously they're in the second round for reasons because they're a good football team. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, – I think we'll get a great, great effort out of those guys. I think they're extremely, extremely well coached. I think, uh, you know, nothing but respect for those guys as well. So, um, you know, we'll have our work cut out, out for us for sure. Yep, and the only area we haven't talked about, because obviously it was key for Stevenson in that game, is just special teams. I mean, how confident have you guys been in that department this year, uh, the type of – kind of focus you put on it each week and just uh, what do you expect uh, in that department against Stevenson? Well, I think, um, you know, that if you look at that Pace Academy game, I mean, they returned two kicks for touchdowns. So um, obviously your coverage teams, they got some dangerous, dangerous return men in their um, kickoff return and their punt return game. So I think if you look at um, – look at them there you got to realize you can't take plays off and you know special teams a lot of times special teams come down to to uh who wins or loses the football game so i think uh special teams is something that we prepare we we like to you know pride ourselves in and and um, i always think that that you know good football teams are good on special teams yep and then uh last question about 4a i mean i think uh with the reclassification it got just so much uh, deeper and better this year. I'm not saying it wasn't good last year, but I mean, when you have Stars Mill not making the playoffs, uh, it's, I think that's validation. It's gotten pretty, pretty talented across the board. But what's your overall perception of just what you've seen in uh, 4A this year? Well, um, I haven't kept up with a whole bunch of of what goes on outside of our region. You know, it's, it's really sometimes I think you can spend your time worrying about. Uh, you know this team or that team, and then you never see them. So you know, we just we try to try to keep our our, our minds on what we've got ahead of us. I, I do, you know. Obviously, there's good football teams everywhere. I know I've seen some of Perry scores, and we played them last year. I know they're they're a really really talented football team. I know they brought a lot back. I know Bainbridge is still alive, and we we dealt with them uh, two years ago. So um, you know, Benedictine. If you look at them. North Oconee, we've we've run across most of those guys um, at some at some point in the last three years or in, in my career I've run across them so I know those you know those names and you know Burke County I know um, they do an outstanding job too so there's there's a lot of teams that that weren't in 4A last year that are in 4A this year that that are still alive um, so uh, you know <laughs> it's yes. just um, you're, you're in the state of Georgia. And it doesn't matter what classification you're in, if you're in the late rounds, you're going to run across some, some really, really well-coached and really, really athletic football teams. Absolutely. Well, Coach Abrams, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, best of luck tonight against Stevenson. Congratulations on the perfect season, and we will be looking forward to seeing what the Bulldogs do out there. All right. Thank you, sir. Yep, you bet. All right, so there goes the number one ranked Cedartown Bulldogs. What time is it? All right, we, we're – We'll take one more quick break while we get Jordan on. Uh, we'll be back on the other side uh, with some more picks. Our mission has always been to support Georgia farmers. That's why we created Georgia Farm Bureau Mutual Insurance Company, providing financial protection that farmers needed. While this remains the same today, we've grown to protect all Georgians through home, auto, and life insurance. From the very beginning and into the future, we stand for every Georgia community. We are all Farm Bureau. All right, welcome back. So we've had a busy hour, but we got time now to close out the show with Jordan Dubroff. We're going to make a couple more predictions. Some of these games we didn't get to. You guys can follow us tonight, scoreatl.com. We'll have all the scores updated live, and we'll have our big second round roundup 
Uh, all the games are in one night this week, so that's a good thing. We're going to try to get as many as possible. We'll have a write-up on all these games, and then obviously starting at 8 o'clock, we'll be kicking off live from Buford on Peachtree TV. We'll also tweet out the link to stream the matchup. It is going to be an exciting night for sure, but we'll go ahead and talk to Jordan. All right, Jordan, sorry you got cut off last time. Um, I was starting off just with our game. I think it's going to be really exciting. Uh, number one ranked Buford, Walton go in there with a lot of momentum, a lot of swagger and confidence. Uh, do you think the Raiders can pull this one off tonight? Yes, I got Walton winning this game 52-42. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. Yeah, that would be incredible. So, yeah, the, yeah, the score off is we are picking Walton. And don't hold his, don't hold it against us. But, uh, yeah, it's just one of those uh, matchups. I think uh, Buford matches up well with a lot of other teams, but Walton with Heklinski, I think that's going to be a really tough one. And I like the way Botterford's been playing. Uh, his ability, I mean, he can take 24, 25 carries. I mean, he is a real deal class 70 back, so don't sleep on Walton. Um, let's look elsewhere, though, in class 7A across the bracket with uh, Mill Creek and North Cobb. A really intriguing matchup right there. Uh, who do you like in that one? I like North Cobb in that game. I have North Cobb winning that game 42. 37. North Cobb with the one. Yep, that will be a big one. North Cobb uh, beat Walton pretty badly. They've had an outstanding season. I think their only losses were to uh, Buford and then Northside Warner Robins in overtime. So they've been in the fight every single week. Uh, I expect another close game. Um, what about, let's see. Um, Let's go to the top left. I think this one might be interesting with uh, Lambert and North Gwinnett. Both really great programs. I'm going to have to go with Lambert with the win. Lambert winning this game 37-27. Yep, and uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier this week. I mean, I like the way North Gwinnett's playing. Ryan Hall at quarterback's been a great story. Uh, their offense has been creative, plugging guys in and keep uh, times to add their best playmakers into it, get them the ball. But I also think Lambert has done a good job of uh, calling creative plays, using trick plays, and uh, they've had a, a great season too. Their only loss was to Milton. Um, let's see. Let's do one more Class 7A1. Um, what do you think about the Norcross and Milton game? I know Najee went to North Cross. I'm going to have to take North Cross to beat Milton. Okay. North Cross with the 42-32. 42-32. That North would Cross be a huge win for North Cross. And I think, uh, I think North Cross this year, they do have one of their better offenses. The defense is playing well, too, but... Um, I have been impressed with their offense. They had a 37-13 win over Mountain View, and then we know what Milton can do um, offensively with their passing attack and running game with, what is it, Scott Motzowitz or whatever his name is. What's his last name, the running back? Maskowitz. Yeah, that's right. He had a big performance against Cherokee, but I would not be shocked if Norcross comes out there and gets the win. It will be another great game. Uh, what about 6A? Let's see. Who do you like in the uh, Alatoona Roswell game? I like Roswell in this matchup. Roswell has a really great team. They played really well this season. I'm going to have to go Roswell with the win. 47 27 beating Alatoona. Yep, that will be a really interesting one. Um, Roswell is coming off a 55-8 win over Lanier, and then Alatoona is also coming off a big win, the 24 nothing win over Douglas County. Um, same side of the bracket, but at the bottom quadrant. What do you think about um, South Paulding and Gainesville? Uh, undefeated Gainesville against South Paulding. Love Josh Nipwood over there, really great coach. He's done a great job in his first year at Gainesville. I'm going to have to 
Nebraska with Gainesville with the win, 52-32. Beating yeah. Oh. yeah, it will be definitely um, up to Gainesville's defense, slowing down that South Paulding rushing attack. I think it's going to be a good game, though. Um, then let's go down to 5A, a game uh, Najee covered um, all over um, his YouTube with interviews and also his Game of the Week preview, Cartersville and Cambridge. That is a great second-round matchup. I'm going to have to go with Cambridge in that match. Cambridge program as well, what they've done all season. I'm going to have to pick Cambridge to win that game. Yep, and then one we haven't talked about yet, but I think it will be interesting. Uh, you have a cast team that beat Jefferson last week. That was a big upset, number four seed Cass, and then they're going to be playing Mays, who beat Centennial. So what do you think about the Mays and Cass game? I love what Mays program has done this season. They've done really well. I'm going to have to go Mays beating Cass. 27-7, I think it's going to be a really, really close game. Yeah, I do think uh, Maze is, uh, they aren't necessarily underrated at this point, but I think, um, I mean, that win over Centennial was impressive, 44-16. They've been playing really well down the stretch. They played Creekside extremely close. That was a one-point game. So I will definitely be paying attention to that one. Um, let's go to, let's see. Let's go to 4A and pick out a game or two. Let's see. Who do you like? Actually, let's go to 3A. Sandy Creek and Stevens County. That's one of the most evenly matched games according to the Maxwell ratings. I think it's a one-point swing for I can't remember who. But, I mean, those are two really good teams. Uh, one of the top ten matchups in the second round this week. What do you think about Sandy Creek and then Stevens County at home? I'm going to have to pick Sandy Creek. Um, I think it's close games to get out to a fast. So I'm picking them when 37 Yeah, so, I mean, let me see if I have some notes on that one. So, yeah, Sandy Creek, 70-14 to 14 win last week over Coola Creek. Um, if I'm, if my memory is correct, I think someone was covering that game in the office and they were like, Sandy Creek's up 60 and they're going for two. So maybe they ran up the score a little bit, but I've been impressed with them. Uh, they have a win over Carver Atlanta this season. And then you have Stevens County. I mean, they have been lighting it up this season. I think that will be a great game. Uh, let's see if we have – were there any other ones that uh, specifically stood out to you, Jordan, that we haven't gotten to? I love it game tonight. Yeah, that's uh, against North Oconee, right? The game. Yeah, do you yeah. think uh, love it can – compete with undefeated North Oconee just after that emotional win over Westminster last week. Jordan, can you hear me? North Oconee. I got love it when I can hear you. I can hear you. All right, yeah, we got you. Yeah, keep going. Sorry. Yep, so I just found it. This is interesting. The Maxwell Computer Rankings, I think that might be one of the most lopsided. They have North Oconee winning 31 to nothing, a 97.3% chance of winning. Uh, the only one higher than that, I think, is Cedar Grove. They're a 32-point favorite over Hebron Christian. And then Colquitt, actually, yeah, Colquitt's a 40-point favorite over Harrison. Very interesting. Uh, what about the Calhoun-Kell game? I mean, can, can Kell put it together? They have a great freshman receiver. They have Bryce Clavin at quarterback. They got Bobby May as head coach. 
Uh, Calhoun's a great team. I mean, what do you think uh, in that matchup in 5A, Calhoun and Kel? Program got a winning 37. Absolutely. All right. Well, Jordan, any other uh, things you're just looking forward to with the second round? I mean, this is a, a big deal. The teams that win tonight, they're going to get to play uh, Thanksgiving week, uh, move on to the quarterfinals. So, I mean, are you predicting a night where there's kind of a lot of shocking results and upset statewide? I think there's going to be upset that tonight. So, see who gets to move on by their Thanksgiving. Yeah, no, it will be a really fun week. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on. We are looking forward to it. We'll have all this coverage tonight. Uh, but thank you guys for tuning in. We will be back on Monday uh, to recap all these second round results. We'll see if we're wrong or right. Uh, we'll either be taking the victory lap or uh, hiding in shame. No, I'm just kidding. But we'll be back. Tune in tonight. Go to scorytail.com and we will see you then.